All right, hello, welcome, uh, welcome back. Uh, starting a very exciting chapter one notes today. Uh, so chapter four, I uh, just talk for a second. Uh, chapter four was all about how we get um, good data. That could be how do we sample some population um, and hopefully get a representative sample uh, whereby we can get the opinions or characteristics uh, representative of that entire population. Because remember, it's, it's, a, it's a pain to take a, a census, talking to everybody. That's, that's a lot of work. Um, but, you know, we can take a sample and hopefully if that sample is gathered in an unbiased method uh, using well-worded questions that don't generate some sort of response bias, um, we might know those true opinions about the population or have a, have a decent idea. Think of public opinion polling, election polling. Um, we're doing this all the dang time. Why do we do it? So, um, I don't know. So, news corporations have something to talk about. Um, more practically, campaigns do these sorts of things to say, well, where do I need to go spend my money? Because remember, in, in statistics, all this stuff we do, there's a, there's a decision, hopefully, somewhere at the end of it. Um, and for um, elections, for uh, campaigns, that decision might be where do I need to spend my ad money? Where do I need to uh, go uh, spend some money on Facebook, uh, put some uh, TV ads on during uh, every NFL football game, uh, for example? So, um, or how do we generate an experiment where we know, okay, this treatment causes this difference because everything else was the same, some sort of uh, random assignment. So lots of, lots of things to consider from last time regarding how we get the good data. Um, this time, uh, chapter one is going to be about... Um, analyzing data, looking at the results that we might have got from um, a survey or an experiment uh, from chapter four. So uh, that's where we're diving in. Um, let's uh, take a look at a few things. Uh, first reminder is that there is a completed notes um, on uh, Schoology. It's not, it's bare bones. The completed notes are like very, it's, it's, it's minimal. Um, it's not going to have the the spice that I'm getting through the conversation. I'm certainly going to be writing more than are found in most of the notes, except with the exception of the AP um, AP practice questions. That's really why we're we're going to be looking at these, especially these last few here um, in the notes. Uh, as an aside, you can you can skip uh, part part C on that. Uh, very last question. So, uh, we a goal is to go through 1.1 today. Uh, I would have the completed notes up uh, on the side, um, and uh, let's let's get to it. Let's get back into it. So, uh, at 1.1, analyzing uh, this word up here, categorical data. Uh, categorical data is sometimes called qualitative data. So we've got two types of data today. We're going to deal with uh, largely qualitative. Tative. Uh, we're also going to have a data called uh, quantitative. And uh, there's some nice uh, roots that we can uh, see at the start of those two words. Qual qualit quality. Some characteristic. Quant, that would be some... Uh, number. So we're going to have qualities uh, that measured not not measured with numbers, uh, quantities measured with numbers, qualities and quantities, right? Uh, so there's two types of qualitative data. There is nominal data uh, that that is just like named groups, named categories. Uh, we're also going to have ordinal data, which hopefully you can see is going to be ordered categories. Um, so we'll have nominal and ordinal. Nominal, nom, name. Nom means name. Uh, nom de plume, the, you know, nom de guerre. That root means name. And that means like writing name and war name. You know, nom de plume, some people didn't use their real name to write books, right? Nom de guerre, some people come up with a name for when they go to war. Whatever, you don't care. Um, quantitative, that, that's obviously numerical data. We will have um, two types there, discrete and continuous data, U, O, U, S. Uh, discrete data would be, you know, taking specific values, three, four, five, six, 
whereas continuous data would be anything uh, between on some interval, negative infinity to positive infinity. It might be zero to positive infinity. Discrete, for discrete, I think of something like shoe size. Uh, for continuous, I think of something like, uh, I don't know, weight. Shoe size, what are your shoe sizes? Eight, eight and a half, nine, nine and a half, ten. There's only specific values. So discrete makes me think specific. And continuous is like anything on some interval. So we've got two, uh, two types of data and two kind of subheadings under each of those. Take a moment, go through these nine and say, do I know what kind of data these are? How would they get plotted? Are they gonna be on a number line or are they gonna be with named differences? Take, take like, take like, like I shouldn't take you five minutes, take like three minutes. What kind of data are these? Pause, try it yourself. Thanks for pausing. Uh, so you go through this and you can you can look at the key. It has them there. Uh, number of students in a class who turn in before the paper is due. Well, that's going to be uh, what's gonna, it's going to be discrete. I'm just going to put the second heading um, that, you know, you can have one student turn in, two students turn in. You can't have two and a half students turn in. That would be weird. Uh, amount of fluid dispensed. That's going to be continuous. Birth order classification, very clearly going to be ordinal data. So this is a uh, quant, quant, qual, um, the state of birth. Well, that's, that's nominal data. We've got named states. There's no order, no obvious order for those. So that's qual. Price of a textbook is going to be you can go with discrete. Um, an argument can be made on this one. That's going to be quantitative data, obviously. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, for number six, concentration of contaminants. Uh, that's going to be continuous. Uh, again, quant. Uh, number seven, zip code. Zip code is kind of a weird one. You guys ever seen a zip code map? It's kind of all over the damn place. What is the zip code? Is there something 64153 about this place I'm, I'm living in? No, that's just a, it's like a name, but there were two ways to come up with names for every zip code. So zip code is just a, is that, it's truly nominal. That's the confusing one. That, so that's really a qualitative equality. Um, actual weight, number eight, that's gonna be continuous, uh, quant, and the number of insufficient checks is going to have to be discrete, uh, quant. So the type of variable it is influences how you'd graph it. Obviously, qualitative data, it doesn't make sense to put these on a number line. Quantitative data can be put on a number line. So that's, that's the big difference there. So, uh, moving on to the next page, uh, what are we going to be doing this chapter? We're talking about graphs distributions of variables, whatever the heck that means. A variable is some characteristic. And I like this phrase because people mess this up. A variable can take different values. Make sure you underline variables take values, right? My, you know, I, I, you know, I weigh, I weigh a, 165 pounds or whatever. That's, that's not a variable. 165 is the value that that variable took. Right. And so a distribution of variables of a variable tells us what values the variable take takes and how often it takes them. What does that mean? It shows what's common. What's uncommon? What are the extremes? Uh, a, a distribution is a visual representation of of uh, the variable, uh, what values it's going to take, and how often it takes these values. Often this distribution uh, is going to be displayed with an equation, or it could be uh, displayed with a, a graph. Um, and for us, it's, it's going to be more useful generally as a graph. Uh, when graphing, things to remember, what are things you got to put on a graph? Right? You got to put some things on a graph. You got to make sure you don't you know, forget some of these important things. Where are some good things? Maybe a title. Uh, maybe labeled axes, pens dying, uh, might be, ooh, consistent intervals. What does that mean? 
Well, each chunk, five, 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 don't make this worth five, and this worth a thousand, and this worth five, and this worth a thousand. Don't want to do that. No deception there. Uh, you want, so you want consistent intervals. What else do you want? You maybe want a key or a legend. What else do you want? Title, labeled axes, consistent intervals, key legend. Anything else you want? Um, I think that's probably good. What's the difference between frequency and relative frequency? And when is it better to use relative frequency? Well, frequency is like the count of how often or how many. Whereas a relative frequency is the count of how many divided by the total number of individuals or counts. So what does a relative frequency do? Relative frequency is really something like a proportion. And when is relative frequency good to use? We're going to use this when comparing groups of unequal size. And the next example gives us a pretty obvious case where this relative frequency would be useful. Um, two different groups, strata, uh, of uh, males and females, men and women, males and that's, that's it's weird. Uh, uh, males and females were surveyed on their favorite ice cream. Results are shown below. Okay, make an appropriate display of the of the data. So, an appropriate display. Consider what that means for a second. Take a moment. Consider what would make this inappropriate. Take a look at these. How many males did we uh, survey here? We surveyed fifteen males. How many females we survey? We surveyed seven. So it's not going to be fair to compare frequency. Why is it not fair to compare frequency? Because we talked to more than twice as many males. What, what, is, what is this graph going to show? That males have a higher chocolate bar, vanilla bar, and strawberry bar. Does that tell me anything? No. Just, oh, all the bars are taller. Great. Males like everything more? It doesn't make any sense. So it's not, compared, uh, it's not fair to compare frequency. Since the groups are of unequal size, we need to compare relative frequency. What proportion of males likes chocolate? So you're going to consider those out of 15, out of 15, and out of 15, and out of 7, and out of 7, and out of 7. And so what's that going to give you? Um, well, get your, get your calculator out. Turn those into percentages. Here's one potential appropriate display. Um, this thing right here is called a, let me type it out for you here. Um, this thing is called a stacked bar graph. What, what does this do? It shows um, proportions of a whole group uh, in a single uh, bar. So what does this show us here? Um, well, what, what, is, what does this mean? So, okay, what does this show? It shows something like, uh, ooh, draw, there we go. Something like 51% um, um, of males like chocolate. Something like, I don't know, what is that like? 25% of males uh, like vanilla and something like, I don't know, 20% of males like strawberry you would actually need to go through and show the dividing by 15 to get those and multiply by 100 and turns it into a percentage. That's what was done here. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll leave that trivial calculation uh, to you. So what does this show us? This, this lets us compare. Uh, if you were to, to write about this, what does this show us? It, it, it appears that uh, males uh, tend to prefer uh, 
chocolate, uh, whereas uh, females, it's weird to talk about males and females for people. Let's talk about men. Um, uh, whereas women um, seem to prefer vanilla ice cream. Um, such a comparison couldn't be seen if we just looked at the raw counts, because think about what that would have looked like. All the, all the male bars would have been taller. There's an alternative way you could have made this graph. Let's, let's consider that for a second. What would another option have looked like? Another fine option would have been something like this. Maybe you could have done chocolate, vanilla, and strawberry. Uh, and out to the side, you could have had proportions. Uh, you could have had, I don't know, uh, 10%, 20%, 30%, 40%, you could have done this. And you could have had, uh, oh, I don't know, for, you could have maybe had a little key and said, uh, men get the empty box and women get the uh, cross hatched box. Could have had something like that. And you could have had a graph uh, that looks vaguely like uh, this. That'd be a 28. Uh, vanilla, 4 to 15. What is that? A little more than 20%. Uh, three out of seven, what is that? Like 42%. Uh, Three out of 15 for strawberry, that's 20%. And two out of seven, that's 28%. So we're talking about a graph that looks something vaguely like this. This would have worked as well. We would have called this a side-by-side uh, -side bar graph. So you can use a side-by-side -side or, a, or a stacked. It doesn't, doesn't really matter as long as your key is clear. Um, I suspect most of you probably did this as opposed to the stacked bar graph, but both are acceptable and they show the same data. This makes us, this allows us to make comparisons across flavors a little bit easier, yeah, whatever. One for you to try. Talking about graphical displays still. Um, the first part should be pretty straightforward. I think you can make the graph. Part B is the part that you might struggle with a little bit. Describe differences and similarities. Make sure you do both. Okay, when it says that, differences and similarities need to talk about both in hurricane damage amounts across the three regions. Okay, so across among the three regions, that would be Gulf Coast, Florida, and the lower Atlantic. If it says this, okay, we need to talk about both. And if it says among the three regions, we need to talk about all of them. If they ask you to do something, if they're explicit about this and this, don't just do one. If they talk about all three, talk about all three. So uh, first thing, uh, pause. Uh, this is going to take you uh, maybe um, six or seven minutes, I'd say. Pause, take a few minutes, uh, come back and try, try and make the graph. You need to become pretty quick at making graphs. You're going to need some sort of key here. And then describing the differences might take you a little longer. Take a moment, pause, and let's look at that. We'll look at the key together. So it's taken you a little bit. You should have made a, uh, a graph that looked something like this, I, I think is it's really one of the few reasonable ones you might make here. Let's, uh, let's take a look here. Damages in millions of dollars per acre. So we've got a good, um, excuse me, a good label on our x-axis. Um, distance in miles, how far away are we? Um, some of you, uh, instead of writing the words down here, what I probably would have done is I would have made a little key in the corner and said, you know, okay, the empty box is G Gulf Coast. The, uh, the scratchy box is uh, Florida. And the uh, shaded box is uh, Atlantic. It doesn't really matter. Um, I, I think just writing all those words and they're really, really, it's just a lot of confusion I don't need. Uh, so some sort of different cross hatch, hatching method. Um, so if they're distinct, that would work too. And you know, you would have just scratched those in. Um, so something like that would have worked, um, but then describe the differences. Okay, describe the similarities and differences. So you gotta make sure you speak to both of those things. What are the similarities? 
Well, the similarities, not, not surprising, as we get further from the coast, all three regions show a declining trend in damages. So as we get further away from the coast, the damage done seems to go down. And this happens in all of the regions. You're noticing boop, boop, boop. Boop. As we get further away, damage goes down. That's a similarity. What are the differences? Well, uh, Florida, you know, that peninsula sticking out in the middle of the ocean there, that seems to get battered a little harder. Uh, why? Because there's ocean on both sides. Um, so Florida seems to have larger um, damages at uh, almost, almost every range, except for the five to 10. The Gulf Coast seems to get a little more there. But something about Florida having generally higher damage amounts at the same distances. Let's take a look at the key. Uh, all three regions uh, tends to decrease as the distance from the coast increases. And for almost all given distances, the Florida region has the largest damage. And conversely, I don't think you, you need to say this, uh, for any diff given distance, the Gulf Coast and Lower Atlantic have smaller amounts. So something, something to that effect, speaking to all three, saying, okay, what's similar? The downward trend, what's different? Florida tends to get hit worse than Gulf Coast and Atlantic. Something like that, maybe two or three sentences. If you don't have that, take a moment, uh, copy that down. All right, so now one of my, my favorite topics of the course, and when you get to this in notes, please at some point uh, on, on, when I have you in class for these units, say, Mr. Kravis, show me some of your favorite deceptive graphs. I, I will, I will willingly do so. So two par gra uh, possible bar graphs, the data are shown, uh, which one would be concept considered deceptive and why? So we have like, what kind of computer did you previously own? And we have two graphs that actually show the same data, but we've made a deception. We've, 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 we've tried to um, pull one over on you. What have we done? Well, what would we do here? Same data. You know, this is this is 18% here, and this is still 18% here, right? This is uh, maybe 12% uh, here, and this is maybe 12% here, and this is, and it's 70 on both sides, right? So these show the same data, but most people don't look at graphs as close as I do. I'll, I'll be frank with you. Most people, they see a graph and I think their eyes glaze over. And I'm one of the few people in the room that does one of these when somebody tries to put up a graph on the screen. What? I say to myself, what are they trying to pull on me? What's well, it's different. There's a clear deception being per uh, perpetuated here. This is called, right here, what is this called? This is called truncating the y-axis. What have they done to you here? What's the deception? They have cut off the y-axis to make the bar appear smaller. Um, they, if you start at 10, you exaggerate the apparent difference in the data. There is no real difference, but we exaggerate the apparent difference. How do we exaggerate that apparent difference? Because we trick your eye into comparing area, areas, and not the number. You look at them and you say, oh, well, think about it. Here, I'm going I'm to use widths of my finger here. No, none is one finger tall. And Macintosh is one, two, three, four, five. Oh, so looks like, you know, right here, you know, this is like three or four times bigger, it appears. Well, what's the apparent difference in the heights of these bars? Not the, not the real difference. I recognize that they're like 52 apart, but the apparent difference, think about this. You can fit like 10 of those. And, you know, this looks like eight to 10 times bigger. So by cutting off where it starts, our eyeball just looks at the areas and says, oh, well, that's much larger. So you can, you can have deceptions, uh, and those deceptions in graphs usually involve um, a trick with the eye. 
I'm going to show you just one of the crappy graphs I like. Ask me in class. I'd love to show you some more. All right, let's keep uh, keep after it. So uh, next thing. Uh, oh shoot! I was going to show you that. Poop. Just just one deceptive graph for you. I'll show you more. Here's one from uh, Fox Business. Um, if the Bush tax cuts expire, what happens? My God, look at how much taxes are going to go up, guys. Look, it's like, it's like, oh my God, it's so much. We have like this much, and now we've got like one, two, three, four. Oh my God, taxes are going. It looks like taxes are getting five times larger. Hot dang. Why are taxes getting so big? Oh, they're not getting five times larger. They're going 35% to like 39.6%. Uh, and that's a, that's a top tax rate. And that's only, you know, you know, you know how tax brackets work. You don't, not everything gets taxed at 39.6, but, but whatever. Um, but it's not getting five times bigger. It's getting 4% bigger. Deceptive. What have they done here? They start the graph at 34. That is just outright deception, outright deception intended to take the take uh, advantage of the fact that your eyeball just see little bar big bar oh shoot they're making me so much more taxes just one bit of deception that can come from truncating that uh that x excuse me that y axis all right let's let's really get back to it this time uh segmented bar graph something I, I i did one of those before for you for um ice cream flavors Last thing I've got for you, last real topic, is this thing called a two-way table. What's a two-way table? It shows uh, the distribution of two variables uh, from a single population, uh, or it may just be from a sample. So some, some set of data showing the distribution of two variables from a single population or uh, or sample. Um, what uh, what are the two variables described by this two-way table, and how many young adults were surveyed? Okay, so we got we got two variables here: uh, young adults by gender and chance of getting rich. So there's two variables here. Out to the side is chance of getting rich. Up at the top, you see is gender. So gender and chance of getting rich. Uh, how many young adults were surveyed? Okay, you're going to see down here at the bottom, 4826 is your table total. Uh, we're also going to have row totals and column totals. We'll see those, and we have these individual cells. We'll talk about what those mean on the next page, talking about these ideas of marginal and conditional distributions. So a conditional distribution, what is that? It's a distribution for a subpopulation. When I think conditional, I think zooming in on some subgroup. Conditional distribution. It shows the probability that a individual random selected item in the subpopulation has a characteristic of interest. Okay. Marginal distribution are the totals for the probabilities they're found on the margin. Marginal distributions are for only one variable. It's like we ignore the other. Uh, so we'll talk about what conditional and marginal distributions uh, look like in the context of this uh, uh, data involving young adults by gender and chance of getting rich. So uh, sorry about that. Uh, number one, what is the percent of the females that's why, why we males and females, men and women. Uh, it's weird. We talk about like animals as males and females, men, men and women. All right, what are the per, uh, percent of the women who have some chance, but probably not? Okay, how do we write that? Well, what are we talking about? So, number one is like of the women uh, who said some chance. Well, we can write that as a probability statement. Here's our very first probability statement of the, cla of the class. Probability that they said some chance given that they were a woman. So what is this? This thing out back here, this is the condition. That is the thing we're zooming in on of the women. 
So for number one, of the women, who said some, but probably not? Some here is 426. 426 of these women said some chance out of a total of 2367. That right there is a conditional probability. I'm going to use different colors for this one because I'm going to end up marking all over this two-way table. You might consider doing the same. Uh, number two says, given you are almost certain, what is the probability that you're a male? Okay. Is this marginal or conditional? Given that you are almost certain. So you are almost certain. That's the thing we're zooming in on. What percent of the females? That was the thing that we're zooming in on. So here we're looking at of the almost certain people, of these folks, what proportion are male? So probability uh, male, given that we're zooming in on the almost certain folks. So of the almost certain folks, five, nine, seven are male out of a total of 1083. Those are conditional, where we're zooming in on some subset of the population. Uh, part three, what is the probability the young adult is a good chance? It ignores the other thing, the, the, the gender. So what's the probability of their good chance? Uh, a good chance is 421 out of a total of 4826. Probability, good chance, uh, 1421 out of 4826. On that one, that's marginal. Where did we find it? On the margins. These are the totals. This is, these are the totals out here. Uh, so we can, we can find these marginal and conditional probabilities. Um, this also was conditional. So we can find marginal and conditional probabilities uh, and we can see them there. Uh, last thing we say, there's an association between two variables. If s association, specific values of one tend to occur with specific values of the other. Um, but be careful, a strong association doesn't imply a causation. There could be those other variables lurking in the background. Just because two things are associated doesn't mean that one is causing the other. Um, I think we'll do uh, one last example here for today. I think you're going to do, uh, do it on your own, and I'll come back and look at the key together. Calculate the proportion of on-campus students in the sample who participate in at least one extracurricular activity and the proportion of off-campus students that participate in at least one extracurricular activity. So on-campus at least one is seven and 17 out of 33. Seven plus 17 out of 33 is 24 out of 33. Off campus proportion, at least one activity, that would be 25 and 12 um, out of 67, that is 37 out of 67. So that one's not too bad. You now try your hand at the writing. Write a few sum sentences summarizing what the graph reveals about the association between residential status and level of participation among the 100 students in the sample. Talk about, OK, for on-campus students, what proportion's the biggest? Off-campus, what's the biggest? What's the smallest? Take it, or what's similar? Um, so take a moment, answer that. I think that'll be the last thing we do for today. I'm gonna flip over to the key, pause it, finish it. All right, so taking a look at the key, uh, you might have said, okay, well, I, you, didn't even, you didn't even actually need to turn those fractions into uh, percentages you, or decimal approximations. You can leave it as the fraction. The fraction's exact. Um, the decimal approximation is an approximation. Taking a look at the graphs, what do we see? On-campus residents, 
they're more likely to participate in one activity than off-campus residents. Uh, two is pretty similar, about the same number of uh, individuals participate in two, but very clearly a larger uh, proportion participates in one on campus uh, than off campus. Um, similarly, uh, we have um, off campuses uh, much larger in the none case than in the on campus so. case. Um, you need to speak to those. Look at the look at the key down there. Should look something like that. Should talk about uh, make a comparison for each of those groups. Probably. Uh, that's that's about it. Let's take a look at the notes. Finish it up. Uh, all right, sake of time, we're going to skip this Pew Research thing about cell phones. It's it's a very similar uh, problem. And then you've got something here um, about um, you can't actually do Part C. If you want to do Part A, you can. It's a it's a pretty quick question um, involving a conditional probability, and then you're done. Uh, take a look at your uh, essential questions on the back. See if you can answer those. Yeah, good deal. See you next time.